Folks, this is Book Talk with Corbin. I'm your host, and we have with us a Professor John Ellis. He's going to talk to us about a subject that I think is really one of not only a, a very important one on as it relates to college education and, and university campuses, et cetera, but the country as a whole. Everyone should really um, digest what we're about to uh, what we're about to discuss. Let me introduce our guest today, Professor Emeritus of uh, German Literature at the University of uh, California, Santa Cruz. Uh, he's taught in other countries, England and Canada. Um, he joined the uh, University of California in 1996 and served as Dean of Undergraduate Division from 1977 to 1986. And he's the author of 10 books. And just before we started this, we were sort of joking around about how somehow or another he found the time to do that. Um, as most of you know, listening to my podcast, I do a special mentoring program for uh, young black males. We focus on boosting their, their reading proficiency. And, and man, I got I to bribe the heck out of him just to read one book. And this brother, he finds the time and the stamina to write 10 books. Professor, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. Professor, I'd really like to talk to you about the, the little time we have about your book, The Breakdown of Higher Education, subtitle, How It Happened, The Damage It Does, and What Can Be Done. How did you come to write that book? Well, I was, uh, I began academic teaching, teaching at the university level in 1959. Mm -hmm. And over the next 60 years, I saw a massive deterioration. And the, the shape of that deterioration was that the uh, universities went from being places where students were taught how to think for themselves to analyze problems, to see issues from all sides, you know, compare competing ideas, strengths and weaknesses of one idea versus the strengths and weaknesses of another idea. All of that got their brains working independently. So not just that they could handle problems they were facing this minute, but their minds were trained to face problems no one even could imagine 20 years time, 30 years time. Now, we went from that over those, those years I was teaching, we went from that to a situation where far left faculty were not teaching those kids to analyze problems. They were teaching kids to think the way their radical professors think. In other words, instead of opening their minds, they shut them down. Mm. Instead of having them think for themselves, they made them think exactly the way their professors wanted to think and, and nothing else. Now, that wasn't, that transformation took a long time. It took about actually 50 years to really close down the universities, the centers of open thinking. Um, if you go back to, uh, let's see, study done in 1969, there were three left of center professors to every two right of center professors. So in other words, healthy debate between both sides. So if, if one side said something stupid, the other side would, would pick them off and they, they'd regret it. So they, they both learned to be intelligent the way they spoke to each other. They both learned to understand each other's positions. Now, 30 years later, that balance had, had gone. 30 years later, 1999, just the beginning of the 21st century coming up, we've gone to five left to one right. Now that's mm. domination of one side. Already you've got a place where one side doesn't have to listen to the other because it has the numbers. Now that's bad enough, but then the, the floodgates really opened then. And within another five years, we've gone from five to one to eight to one. Mm. But, but think about this, in five years, Take the professoriate as a whole, right? Tens of thousands of them. They go from a 5 1 split to an 8 1 split in five years. Now, think about it. what must the rate of partisan hiring have been 
in those five years. Those, it must, to go from five to one to eight to one in five years, you have to have been re recruiting only left professors for those five years. So in other words, the floodgates have really broken. Now, and now you're at the point where uh, radical professors are indoctrinating and there's no one really to stop them anymore. So that's why kids leave college and the impression that everyone gets of recent college graduates is they don't believe in free speech. Well, the reason for that is their professors didn't believe in free speech because they killed off any opposition to what they were saying. I mean, basically they made sure there's only one opinion in that classroom and only one opinion on that campus. And they made the kids think this way, that that, that was the way to think, period. So anyone who didn't think that way, there was something wrong with them. Hmm. And so you get a whole generation of young people leaving campus thinking that people who speak up in a way they don't like, they don't have to listen to them. They shouldn't have to listen to them. Those, there's something wrong with those people. So all of a sudden, respect for free speech is gone. There's only the right way to speak and the wrong way to speak. Now, Professor, you, you had just used the word indoctrination. Is, is that the word you meant to use? Yes. And how would you, how would you define indoctrination? Indoctrination is when a teacher gives an opinion to a student and says, believe that, and that's, that's the end of your thinking. You don't have to think anymore. You believe what I tell you, and that is the truth. Nobody else has a right to an opinion other than that. That's indoctrination. What a, a real academic teacher does is say to kids, now, here's an idea. Now, let's look at that idea. Let's analyze it. Let's see what its strengths are, what its weaknesses are. Now, let's look at ideas that compete with that, ideas that other people think are better. Now, why do they think it's better? Let's look at the strengths and weaknesses of the competing ideas. Mm. And then the end of it would be, you all have to think it through. All those complications, all those strengths and weaknesses, the comparison of the two ideas, you have to think it through for yourself and form your own opinion based on your best judgment. Now that's education. Anything other than that is indoctrination and indoctrination is worse than no education at all. I mean, people are better off with the common sense they were born with hmm. than to be educated by indoctrinators. Then on top of that, uh, parents are paying for this. They're paying for students are going into tremendous debt over there. They're, they're mortgaging their houses. And if you go back 30, 40 years, it was worth it. Because, you know, when, when higher education was genuine, when it was really equipping your kids to deal with life and deal with problems that no one could even imagine yet, you know, in other words, you'd give them the skill to analyze those problems, even though people don't know what they are yet. Uh, that was really worth mortgaging your house to give your kids that kind of start in life. You know, they'd be, they'd be more, more fulfilled people, they'd have better careers, they'd be materially better off, but they'd be more thoughtful people. They'd be probably happier people. But what's happening right now is parents are paying the same amount of money, but the result is not only you don't get the good result, you actually get a bad result. You get your kids thinking crippled actually, because they come out with bad habits, shouting down other people instead of listening to what they say. That's a bad habit. So in other words, uh, you, you get a minus quantity. You know, in other words, if you don't go to college at all, let's say you start at zero, you don't get any education one way or the other. You used to be given a bonus of many hundreds of points in mm -hmm. your mental ability, uh, and it was worth it. Now you go to college, you're, you're a minus quantity, you know, you're, you're taught bad habits. So and when you, when you say bad habits, I, you know, I've, I've seen some pictures where students were actually violent. Yeah. And they're trying to, you've, you've, you know, of examples like that too. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, if, if a speaker is invited to campus 
And the Radic professors don't like what that speaker is going to say. Students will show up in the audience and they'll shout that person down. Now, a couple of years back, uh, I mean, this is getting worse and worse all the time, but a couple of years back, there were a couple of cases where the speakers were actually physically assaulted. Mm. I mean, pe people wound up with injuries. It's that bad. I mean, if you have radical professors saying, anyone who doesn't think like me is a really bad person, is a really evil person, which is what's being said. Uh, any conservative, for example, I mean, there's a, there's a strong rationale for liberalism. There's a strong rationale for conservatism. They're well-known traditions of thinking going back hundreds of years. Uh, but if a right of center professor uh, uh, holds a, a lecture on campus right now, uh, chances are he'll be, you know, there'll be trouble. There'll be, uh, uh, at a minimum, shouting down, and, and, uh, and actually a rather threatening atmosphere. You know, I'm I'm not a real brilliant student of history, but I, you know, I I watch a lot of documentaries here and there, and I, I vaguely remember about how the the beginnings of the uh, Nazi movement in Germany, where some of the members of the Nazi Party would deliberately send somebody into a speaking engagement to disrupt it and sometimes even to start fights. Yeah. Are you seeing any, are you seeing a similar similar similarity there? You know, it's horrible to say it, but yes, you do see some similarities. Now, the minute you start to use comparisons with Hitler and the Nazis, people get shaky, you know, but it is as well to remember how Nazism started. And it did start with the opposition being shouted down and bullied and uh, you know, threatened. This is how a fascist movement begins. And the, the, uh, the safest protection against that is to have free speech and to have both sides respect you know, the, the right to an opinion and both sides face up to the fact they might learn something from the other side. Mm -hmm. you know? Um, I, I have a favorite saying of um, the philosopher John Stuart Mill. Uh, he said that uh, about the two party system, he said a party of order and stability and a, another party of reform and progress are both necessary elements of a healthy state of political life. Mm -hmm. And then he said something even more, even more important. He said, and it's in great measure the, the, uh, the, the pressure of one on the other that keeps each of them within the bounds of reason and sanity. And he's absolutely right. Once you take away the discipline of an opposition, you know, a bunch of people who are going to look at what you say and say, we think you're wrong for this and that and that reason. Once you take that away, there's nothing stopping one party from getting more and more foolish. Mm. Because what will easily happen is that when you have one party removed from the scene, which I have on college campuses right now, leadership in the one party that remains is no longer with the people that are, that are moderate because they they have to be to counter the other party. They have to be you know, intelligent at countering the attacks from the other party. But leadership with the one party will go to the people who, who voice the most exciting, most far reaching claims for the one side. In other words, the most exposed, the most irrational, the most, the most difficult to support actually, the, the ones that are most exciting, but, but, but unsound. And that's what you've got on college campuses right now. You've got no, you have no discipline. Mm. So that the left gets more and more irrational and more and more foolish. And there's only one way to protect foolish arguments. That's to stop the other side from saying anything. And that, again, that's what's happening. Now, you know, actually, we really don't need to go as far as Nazi Germany, you know, go back, go sort of figuratively go to Nazi Germany or go back in history to Nazi Germany.